Welcome back, everybody. I was going to ask if everyone had good conversations, but it seems like lots of good conversations going on. Um, I trust that you also had a good lunch. Anyone who didn't have the carrot cake is missing out. Um, I won't waste any time. We'll get right into the next session on digital transformation before any postprandial lull sets in. Um, your session chair this time around is Christo Lehtonen, who is the director for the Fair Data Economy at the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra. Christo, please. Thank you, Jason. Great to be with you here today. We have an exciting lineup of speakers coming up on digital uh, transformation. Our first speaker is Mr. Nishant Batra. He's a global leader with broad experience in strategy and technology development and portfolio management. At Nokia, Nishant is the chief strategy and technology officer with responsibility for corporate strategy, technology architecture, and pioneering research at Nokia Bell Labs. The stage is yours, Nishant. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get into a panel shortly, but uh, we're going to kick off. And I felt what would be a good speech be without slides. So it's always good to have a few slides. <laughs> so we're going, to, we're going to walk through something. At Nokia, actually last year, we started putting together what we now call as the tech vision for 2030. We started looking at what the world of 2030 would be in terms of how we as users are evolving how the world in terms of its geopolitical evolution will be, and what impact would that be on the technology that would exist in 2030. We then took a step forward and then we said, okay, how would the networks be? What would be the load on those networks? And then we brought it back to, what should we do as an industry and a company to be ready for that? So I'll show you a short glimpse of that today. Let's start with some tech trends that we now are quite confident of. Cloud economy, this started a decade or more ago, but this is clearly one of the trends that we believe will dominate until 2030. And cloud economy, and we put that bubble of 5G and 6G in the middle there, and that's because in the business of connectivity, We've had now, this is our fifth generation of wireless connectivity, but our belief is that somewhere between this generation and the next generation of 6G, connectivity would also move to the cloud. Cloud will become an enabler also for how we consume connectivity. The other trend that uh, I believe we'll talk a little bit more about in the panel as well is the web, the evolution of the internet. If you go back in 1970s, there wasn't an internet around. There were some data exchange protocols. Then came the 80s and the internet came along, mostly to download stuff. And uh, it was the information economy that started to exist. Then came the 90s and the last decade. And in those decades, that information economy became a platform economy. It was to download stuff, but also to upload stuff and a few dominant platforms came into existence. Now we're entering an era where it's not just to read and write with the internet, it's also to verify. We're entering a trustless economy. And as somebody on the west coast of the US would say, we're entering the blockchain economy on the web. That's the second trend we believe is gonna be quite important to consider in 2030. And then, an overarching trend, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard the term metaverse. That, we believe, is the overarching trend of how the cloud and the web with connectivity as the underlying bedrock will come together to create a digitalization 
of this world through metaverse. And right in the middle where all of these intersect is a technology that everyone talks about and everyone understands somewhat now is AI. All of these are powered through machine learning. And then we started assessing as to what the impact on the market would be. This is what one assessment is. We're talking about a market size, which is almost like a new GDP, an eight to $13 trillion economic growth. And then you can look at the numbers for the rest of those bubbles as well. This is what we believe 2030 would bring, and this is what we as an industry and a company have to be ready for. And then we looked at the metaverse. Now, this term metaverse, of course, is much talked about now, but at Bell Labs, we started researching actually the two building blocks of the metaverse. The first being digital, physical fusion, is the confluence of the cyber and the real. And this is about creating a digital twin of everything that you can create a digital twin of, complemented by human augmentation. How do you insert a human? How do you actually create a virtual representation of something and manipulate the real object through virtual interaction. That's human augmentation. At Bell Labs, we were writing papers about this in you know, 2012. We didn't come up with the word metaverse. But now, since the word's popular, we started to think about this a little bit deeper. We believe that this metaverse will evolve. Today, it's quite rudimentary in the way it exists. There are digital twins, mostly in the industrial domain, some entertainment, some gaming. There is human augmentation, but very rudimentary devices. By 2030, our belief is that both of these will evolve significantly. The power profile of these devices, we will go into exoskeletons. We will then also see very complex digital twins. So what kind of metaverse would exist? And our firm belief is that metaverse is not a singular, it's a plural. The metaverse has to exist in three different dimensions. The most often talked about, the consumer metaverse, social, entertainment, gaming. Our belief is that it will happen the last because the price sensitivity and the technology evolution has a way to go. There is an enterprise metaverse, which is around collaboration, training, corporate, enterprise, IT, evolution to metaverse. We are now in a live environment having this forum, but you could have basically a metaverse-driven Millennium Awards. And then our belief is that the most fundamental difference will be in the industrial metaverse. This has begun to exist today. There are digital twins. There are digital twins, complex digital twins that exist today, of factories, of fabs, of bridges, and they're being used extensively already. This metaverse, in our opinion, will exist the first. And then we started to think about, okay, how do we get the technology right? We're in the era of 5G. We need to move to something else. What would that be? And a brief representation of what we think the evolution of the last mile connectivity that will be required. A network ready for metaverse, what would it look like? We're now in 5G, we're moving to 5G advanced, going to 6G. And there are some characteristics which are quite understood. Of course, we will have much more throughput, the latency will be better, localization would be very, very you know, precise. Today, we know, all of us, we carry this device, and if you were to make an emergency call, the closest PSAP would know that you are in this building. The accuracy of localizing this device is about 50 square meters, and that's what we will find out. But if you're gonna put this metaverse on a production floor, you need to know that that connectivity device is not in this room, but here, in this centimeter in three dimensions. There will be more sensors than humans using that network. And that's what we envision with 6G. So we've already started work on 6G. 
I actually yesterday was at the Brooklyn 60 Summit. We kicked it off with New York University. This is a big part of what we are now trying to get ready for. And these are the six dimensions of 6G. So we figured if it's 6G, it should be six dimensions, right? Uh, it's driven by artificial intelligence, throughput of 100 gigabits per second. It's not built for 50,000 devices per square kilometer. It's built for 10 million sensing devices per square kilometer. It's not built for microsecond latency. It's built for nanosecond latency. It's quantum safe. This is what the world will need for a true pervasive metaverse to exist. And with that note, <laughs> If there was a message in there, I missed it, but okay. <laughs> My message to you, this metaverse, based on the bedrock of 6G, it has to be open and inclusive. It can be a privilege of a few. We would have failed at our jobs if that's the case. This metaverse is open and invitational for everyone and is built not by one company, not by one industry, but collaboratively by all. Thank you. What an exciting collaborative vision that Nishant shared with us. Our next speaker is uh, Marissa Meyer. Marissa has had a front row seat to the development of digitalization on several platforms. She was Google's 20th employee and first woman engineer at Google, and later the CEO and president of Yahoo. Now Marissa is the CEO and co-founder of Sunshine, a startup focused on making everyday tasks easier. Welcome on stage, Marissa. Thank you, Christo, and thank you, Nishant, for that excellent presentation. I love that you ended on the note of something for everyone, how 6G will be for everyone, and that's what my talk is really about today. How do we build software platforms and technology platforms for everyone? And in the spirit of the Millennium Prizes, really thinking about how do platforms touch humanity? Since platforms tend to be an overused word, I thought I would start with a definition. A platform is, in the case of technology, a base on which other technologies are built. And traditionally, when we talk about platforms, we're talking about things like Mac, Linux, Windows, iOS, Android. But with the dawn of the web, platforms became something more. There are still groups of technology, with technology being built on top of them, but they also became tools that enabled non-computer scientists, non-technologists, to build a lot of things, interesting things, and create a lot of interesting things on top of them. I love that Tim Berners-Lee won the first Millennium Prize. It's very fitting because the World Wide Web really was a huge turning point in technology platforms. In the case of the web itself and web-enabled platforms, the platforms are built by computer scientists but used by everyone. Hence the, top, my, the title of my talk, Platforms for the People. The web and subsequent technology platforms that it has driven have been a democratizing force, allowing people to access information they couldn't access before, do things they couldn't do before, create things they couldn't create before. Computer scientists created portals like Yahoo and HTML pages that help people access the World Wide Web. It allowed the distribution of news, sports, stocks, stock quotes, and so forth. I would argue, though, that Yahoo wasn't really a platform. It was a tool for getting the most out of the web, as was Search. Search looked extremely simple, uh, but underneath it was a very sophisticated piece of technology that let people find vital information, real-time information, health, 
health, education, and more. But with search, what we really saw usher in at Google is it gave rise to Google Maps and Google Earth, which, in my view, really were something new. They were arguably the first Web 2.0 platforms. It allowed people to visualize and plot, to see overall how things were overlaid on the physical world. You could see access to healthcare. We could monitor deforestation, still do, from space using satellite imagery. Navigation, traffic, all of these things can be monitored, and you can build on top of the platform of maps and see it and use it in an interesting way. We saw lots of businesses and livelihoods being built on top of and around mapping technologies. And of course, over the subsequent decade, lots of platforms emerged. YouTube, everyone could create and consume videos. Twitter, everyone could broadcast and consume news. Uh, Instagram, everyone is a photo editor. Uber, everyone could be their own transport dispatch. And using these products, hundreds of thousands and millions of people built their livelihoods and their businesses on top of these platforms. Web-based platforms have really helped to democratize uh, society. And Uber and Airbnb have even taken the step of obviously using these platforms to influence the physical world in a really profound way. Lately, people have probably heard a lot about Figma and Canva in the news. This really demonstrates that you can take the power of these platforms and move it to things like graphic design. Figma and Canva do an excellent job making it easier than ever to produce and collaborate on graphic design, which means that my fellow panelist, Tim O'Reilly, had better watch out. That said, there's a lot of energy spent on whether or not these platforms will replace people. For me, I'm an optimist when it comes to technology. I like to talk about platforms for the people. Platforms allow us to create, they allow us to educate, and they also allow us to enjoy an ease of life, uh, an everyday life. These platforms are extremely powerful. They need to be developed in a way with an eye towards how they'll be used, and they also have to be appropriately governed. Some lessons that we've learned the hard way along the way. But I wanted to spend the rest of my talk talking about artificial intelligence, which is the next generation of platforms for people. I believe it's really important to talk about artificial intelligence in a way that's centered on, uh, centered on humans. Stanford has a new institute called Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, which is the way I really like to think about it. We want to think about how can, these, uh, how can AI and these applications ultimately really help people, which brings me to an unusual topic of cucumbers. Um, one of my favorite examples of AI over the past few years was a Japanese farmer realized that his job was quite complicated. I realized when I learned the story that, that cucumbers in Japan are much more complicated, and perhaps they are worldwide, than I had realized. In Japan, they're prized, they can be curved, they can be straight, they can be prickly or smooth, they can be large or small, and all these different dimensions, about nine in all, actually heavily influence the value of the cucumber. So if you're a cucumber farmer, being able to sort your crops into the proper categories of cucumbers is incredibly lucrative. This particular Japanese rural farmer uh, had a son who was a computer scientist, and he wondered, could he take deep learning and actually learn how to have a computer look at the cucumbers and classify them for him. And he did so. It's an amazing application to be able to take something as sophisticated as deep learning, uh, an incredible artificial intelligence technology, and have it applied by someone who is not themselves a technologist in a way that can really ultimately give him a lot more uh, free time and a lot less, uh, spend a lot less time on the mundane activity of sorting cucumbers. We've also seen deep learning applied to the field of alternative energy and climate. By loading weather data, energy outputs, and demand seen historically, we can deliver predictions and optimizations for alternative energy production that can create an incredibly secure, stable, and predictable energy grid that can really help us make an effective dent against climate change. And I also wanted to spend a bit of time on platforms known as large language models or LLMs. LLMs are trained on vast amounts of text, so much text that the model can actually begin to understand words that relate to each other, what word will follow the next word. 
and it can ultimately understand how to put them together in a logical flow that follows syntax, convention, and style. LLMs are trained on billions of parameters. OpenAI has released one that was built on six billion parameters. NVIDIA and Microsoft have built one that has, is built on 530 billion parameters. Google has released a smaller one called Flan that uses finer tuning and, and purportedly less parameters. But what we'll see is overall the order of magnitude of the parameters and training data that go into these models will continue to scale. But already today, large language models are capable of writing blog posts. The Economist magazine experimented with one, fed in all of its historical articles, and could create, and the, the, the artificial intelligence could create Economist-style articles that sounded intelligent as if they were written by a person. It can translate back and forth uh, uh, between different languages and even write computer codes with a prompt. They can synthesize based on this training data in entirely new ways. And one fun such example of this is Dolly. Using large language models, computer scientists asked the question, could they take a natural language prompt, the, the LLM, and associated images, and come up with images and pictures that have never been, come, that have never been seen before or never been developed before? These are the pictures that the AI model came up with for a baby daikon radish in a tutu walks dog. Uh, but you can see it actually did, a pretty, it did an astoundingly good job of, of interpreting that. This next one is an armchair in the shape of an avocado. You may notice that a few of these actually look like Saarinen tulip chairs, uh, indicating that great minds, whether human or not, actually do think alike. Um, and while not entirely practical, these images show how intelligent models can become when they re can respond to entirely new, never seen before prompts. And finally, I wanted to close with a discussion of my discussion of platforms with what I'm working on the moment. My company is Sunshine. We're small and just starting out, and we are hiring. Uh, we are working in the space of personal relationship managers. Can we use heuristics and intelligence to better understand human relationships and make everything from contacts to scheduling and communication easier? Companies, of course, use CRMs, customer relationship managers, giant database with intelligence like deep learning and, and large language models applied on top of them to understand their interactions between customers and the behavior patterns of those customers. Sunshine aims to do the same for personal relationships by allowing computers to understand who we know, how we know them, who we spend time with, we can create a platform that allows people to spend less time on the main mundane and more time on the meaningful. In the face of these incredible platforms and their capabilities, the possibilities are endless. With visualization, synthesis of information, and creation all being enabled in new and never seen before ways, these future platforms will allow us to spend our time more meaningfully and less mundanely. And when we achieve that, we truly will have achieved platforms for the people. Thank you. Thank you so much for that human-centered vision with those great examples. And we can really see how the large language models, use of synthetic AI, it's really pushing the boundaries what it means to be an artist, an author, what it means to be a human being. Our next speaker is Christo Grotsev. He is the CEO of Bellingcat, an organization for investigative journalism. Previously, he was Bellingcat's lead investigator, focusing on security threats, extraterritorial clandestine operations, and the weaponization of information. Christo has been involved in investigations on several major incidents, such as the no Novichok poisonings and the nerve agent poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Most recently, Christo authored a report on Russia's clandestine cruise missile strikes in Ukraine. Christo, welcome on stage. Uh, thank you very much, Christo, um, from Christo. The 
topic today that I would like to briefly talk about um, is not as technological as the two ones that we just heard, but it still um, is on the crux of the interconnection between society and technology. But I'll talk about the danger of what we've observed in an autocratic, modern autocratic society that we've investigated over the last seven years that has been using and abusing and taking advantage of, of data um, in a way where this society actually has become even more advanced in some data access for, for the people than other liberal societies. And this is the society of, of uh, the Russian Federation. Um, imagine living in a society where the local version of the things that you take for granted in the internet, the Google, uh, the Google Maps, the, the Facebooks, the, uh, the Twitter, are all of better quality than the originals. Yeah? Imagine that your speed of communication, of connection to the internet, is three times the average speed that you're used to. Imagine that the mobile services of mobile phones are actually even better. They have better coverage throughout the country and better services than the ones that you're used to. And imagine living in a large society where there's enough content and enough network um, externality for you to be happy with what you're getting uh, culture-wise, content-wise, and communication-wise, uh, even if you don't have to cross into the original Googles and the original Facebooks. Um, would you trade that for one quirk, which is that all of this is owned essentially by one company, and this company is controlled by the government. And this company, or these companies, have a gateway in real time sharing the data with the FSB, the security service. So would you or not? Well, the answer from the Russian side that we saw is that, yes, people were willing to trade that extreme convenience and quality of, uh, of, of, of living in the digital world for privacy, for like they were willing to give away their privacy, even though they were aware of that. Um, they, took, they took the convenience of the online world, they took an e-government, which was very, very well structured and very convenient. You have a single point of, uh, of entry into e-government where you can from paying your taxes, you can also order taxes and you can uh, do everything in between. You can get your fines and, and, uh, and see uh, where you, you are speeding and you can get a discount for your, uh, for your tax down payment. So it was a very, very convenient society. But people were willing to trade that for privacy. And um, that seemed very sustainable. And it was sustainable because the Russian regime the, is, is, in fact, or was until the war started, a typical example of a modern autocracy. Uh, it had realized that you have to give people what they want. And essentially, you give them the metaverse, yes? And you put them there, and you allow them to live freely in there. You also need to understand that people need certain freedoms. They need the freedom to, of, to, to express themselves. But what the Russian autocratic regime had figured out over years of on offline management of society was that you don't need to be completely repressive in the freedom of information and freedom of speech in order for you to achieve stability and sustainability of your autocratic regime. You just need to bubbleize society. You need to make sure that people live and communicate with their, within their own bubbles. And these bubbles can include extremely right-wing conservative religious circles, or they may include a very, very liberal, um, free-oriented, almost anarchistic circles. And that is fine. That was fine in the off online world, as Russia discovered in the early 2000s, um, as long as these circles don't overflow into one another, and as long as people believe that they have a freedom of expression in their own circle. The digital world actually allowed this to perfect itself, because it's bubbleized, the social networks are bubbleized by, by their own nature, by the algorithms that drive them. So. Russia took the digital world as an improvement of its own bubbleization of society. And this allowed people to overshare. This actually triggered people to overshare because they felt safe in the safe space of their own bubble. Uh, they listened to liberal radio stations and they talked to liberal friends, liberal verbal uh, bubble, and they felt safe. And the government never jumped in to interact to, to stop that until they felt that there's some leakage between bubbles and that the liberal one could impact the one of the grandmothers watching television at home and getting to safe propaganda. So this seemed sustainable. But what happened? Why did it not continue? Because it did not. Um, well, part of what happened was citizen 
journalism and journalistic investigations, which took advantage of the same digital, vast data system infrastructure that the government had created to monitor their own society. The government wanted centralized data sets. They got them, they had them. But also the government, uh, the Russian government needed to empower a very, very expansive monitoring surveillance system of FSB officers that needed to make money and the government allowed them to be corrupt. That was an ingredient of an autocratic system. The, they had to allow corruption to secure the services. And that corruption led to leakage of information to the market and that leakage was used by journalists. And Russian journalists, Belink Belinkat was not the first one that took advantage of that. Russian journalists have been using that market of leaky data from state databases for years before we noticed it and took advantage of it. But this allows uh, essentially the same tools to be used by investigative journalists and to expose government crime, to expose uh, government uh, shocking secrets, which causes leaks of information from one bubble to another. And this is what made the whole system insustainable, non-sustainable. Um, how does this work? Well, in a society that is driven to, um, to ask to people to, to overshare, everybody overshares, right? Except when you find somebody who doesn't overshare, suddenly that's an exception. So the, a person who doesn't have a social media account on VK, for us, that's a red flag. That already assumes this may be a security service officer, right? Uh, so in a way, hiding data is is counterintuitively providing us clues to who to investigate. Uh, family members of security service or government officials, they overshare, they continue to overshare. So I can't tell you how many times we've been able to identify a spy based on family members sharing their photographs uh, where they would not have a social media account. But equally importantly, all of the data that is available in these centralized databases meant to monitor people's movements, uh, they're available for sale on a gray and black Russian market of data. And the same FSB government officers who are, who are tasked with protecting the data, with gathering data on their compatriots, they're the ones who are sponsoring the trade because they're making uh, money of that trade. So this has allowed a lot of journalists to actually take advantage of that, uh, of, of, of that centralized data, plus the corruption typical for autocratic regime, and to turn it against the government. Yes, you're not going to be equal-handed in this fight because the government will always have access to big data on every citizen, and you as a journalist will have access to a small selection of the data. But then again, the bad actors are very few compared to the rest of society. So all we have to do is to create enough explosive content to cause this leakage of, uh, of uh, information, of shocking findings from one bubble to another. And when that happens, the government, the autocratic government, falls out of balance and they start doing crazy things. And some, in a more normal society, this may lead to a resignation. In a less normal society, this may lead to starting a war. But in any case, um, a war is not sustainable and uh, an autocratic regime that would have stuck to that balance would have been sustainable for 20 or 30 more years. So, in any case, um, this this uh, digitalization and globalization of society can be used and should be used by citizens and journalists to actually turn the table against the government of autocrats. So that's what I wanted to convey to you. Thanks. Thank you, Christoph, for those very timely examples uh, here in Finland in the country with uh, 1,100 kilometers of common border with, with Russia as well. Our final speaker of the session is Tim O'Reilly. Tim has a history of convening conversations that reshape the computer industry. If you've heard the term open source software or Web 2.0 or the maker movement or government as a platform, Chances are that, he's ha that you have heard of, heard of it because of him, because he's had a hand in framing each of these big ideas. He's the founder, CEO, and chairman of O'Reilly Media, and a partner at early stage venture firm O'Reilly AlphaTech Ventures. Today, Tim will be joining us by video.
Hi, thanks so much for letting me join by video. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm Tim O'Reilly, the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, the publisher and online learning provider that's been teaching Silicon Valley about the future for the past 40 years. I was one of the earliest advocates for the commercial internet, for open source software, and for the renaissance of the web after the dot-com bust, what we called Web 2.0. Now I'm here to talk to you about one of the next big waves of the future, AI, and why any approach to digital transformation has to take it into account. I start with the premise that we live in a world beset by crisis. We all have our individual business challenges, and they're complex. But look at the world around us, wars, pandemics, supply chain disruption, climate change, economic inequality, social instability. Our entire way of life is being challenged, and we need better tools. So all of these crises are related. They're what economic historian Adam Tooze calls a polycrisis. The problems are huge, but the new tools we have actually let us deal with complexity in new ways. J.C.R. Licklider, the uh, uh, DARPA program manager who originally funded the internet, uh, wrote a paper back in 1960 uh, in which he talked about what he called human-machine symbiosis. He said, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. I think this is a fabulous uh, way of explaining what AI actually turned out to be as opposed to this sort of independent machine intelligence. What we're building today are tools for harnessing the collective intelligence of humans. You know, Google is a great example. It gathers content created by billions of human, humans. It uses hundreds of signals, many of them generated by humans. Like, what did they uh, point to when they linked to this other document? What words did they use? Uh, and it uses these signals to find the needle in the haystack 8.5 billion times every day. And it uses implicit feedback from its users to reflexively shape its best, its, its, its sense of the best answers, right? In other words, it learns constantly from the people who use it. That's what I mean by harnessing collective intelligence and why you can think of these systems as a hybrid of human and AI or a hybrid of human and machine. Facebook, Amazon, and perhaps most importantly, our financial markets are cut from the same cloth. The invisible hand of the market has been made digital. And it's increasingly under private control. And that's why I think the fact that our governments are also such a system, just centuries old and out of date, is such a problem. Our tax policy, our laws, and our regulations shape the economy in much the same way as the algorithmic systems at Google, Amazon, and Facebook shape their marketplaces. What we call the market is a designed artifact, not a natural phenomenon. You know, why is homeownership the rule in the U.S., but not in Germany? tax policy. Why are cars in Europe smaller than the U.S.? Taxes again. Why is housing scarce in many U.S. markets? Local building codes. Uh, the examples are legion. I talk about this in my 2016 book, WTF, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us? The imperative for our systems of collective decision making to get as good as the systems that we're building in the private sector. Because algorithmic interventions can spur innovation. Look at the declining cost of solar. Yes, there's been enormous innovation from the private sector, but government funding, incentives, and direction have built that market. The problem is that one-off interventions can have unexpected consequences for the poly crisis. For example, quantitative easing, the fix for the 2008-2009 financial crisis, led to an unsustainable asset boom. Flooding consumers with cash to keep the economy afloat during the pandemic contributed to an inflationary surge. Response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine led to a hardening of relations between the U.S. and China, reshoring of critical industries, and acceleration of the renewable energy transition. Everything's interconnected. And that's where AI comes in. Paul Cohen, who used to be the AI program manager for DARPA, is now a professor of computer science at the University of Pittsburgh, said something wonderful. The opportunity for AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. That's its, its real superpower. Uh, and you really have to understand that these systems are trained. Uh, and we're moving from a system where programmers will 
effectively try to come up with a set of rules. And maybe they'll give users lots of knobs and levers to tweak. To a system that you simply show tens of thousands of examples of what you think good looks like, whether it's like this is a dog, this is a car, or whether it's something more profound. Uh, you know, what is the objective of this system? And they can learn to recognize the patterns and act on them. And I've had a very direct experience of this as we developed a machine learning based search engine for the O'Reilly online learning platform. You know, finding the right answer to a user query, you know, when they're looking for a needle in a haystack from tens of thousands of books and video training courses, it's quite a complex problem. Our old search engine required constant tuning and every adjustment seemed to throw something else out of kilter. Now, using a process uh, of machine learning, we train our search engine holistically rather than trying to adjust the knobs and levers individually. Our users can now ask questions in plain language and be taken right to the answer. Uh, in, in a bigger context, uh, the Institute for Computational Sustainability at uh, Cornell University has done some amazing work with, uh, for example, with the Brazilian power authorities. Uh, rather than just uh, deciding where to site dams on the Amazon for purely economic reasons. They're taking into account not just power generation and money, but also fish diversity, impact on local people, sediment, and greenhouse gas emissions. They've done similar work on coordinating the release of water into California rice paddies with the migrations of waterfowl. And it turns out it's a win-win for both farmers and the waterfowl. Of course, there's a lot to learn. You know, using cutting edge tools, big tech companies have spread misinformation, hate speech, and divisiveness. They've encouraged addictive behavior and even violence. And so there's a lot of fear and uncertainty about turning over decision-making to machines. But it's still very early. I like to remind people of the history of powered flight. In the early days of commercial uh, uh, aviation, crashes were frequent. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince, was one of those pioneering aviators. He carried the mail and other urgent cargo. And his autobiography tells the tale of pilot friend after friend who set off boldly, never to return. He himself was lost somewhere out over the ocean. Yet today, commercial airlines are the safest form of transportation due to rigorous oversight and safety procedures. We need something like that for AI, but it can be done. The other thing to recognize is that AI is a mirror, not a master. When we train these systems, we feed it data from what humans do and what humans have done. And if we don't like the results, if we say those results are biased, what it is showing us is the bias in our own behavior. And so we have to seize the opportunity to look in the mirror. And if we don't like what we see, we need to change it. We can't just blame the machine. And a good example of this is uh, in the bad behavior of these companies. Our government design markets provide the master algorithm, shareholder value. It directs companies to constantly increase their profits and their share price. And this corrupts even companies that aspire to do good. So you think about Google. You know, they used to have the slogan, don't be evil. Yet the, their former head of advertising, Sridhar Ramaswamy, who ran their $115, $115 billion ad business, recently quit, started a new company to compete with them, saying the relentless pressure to maintain Google's growth has come at heavy cost to the company's users. Useful search results will push down the page to squeeze in more advertisements and privacy is sacrificed for online tracking tools to keep tabs on what ads people are seeing. So we are all living and working inside these vast network machines that control our world today. And it's a useful metaphor to think about that. We're living and working inside a machine and that machine is poorly understood and poorly governed and we have to get good at it. So right now, these vast interconnected electronic systems are guided by algorithms that form a kind of private regulatory system, which too often rewards its owners rather than considering the public interest. Government has been left behind. Bringing it into the 21st century means understanding its role in structuring markets and society. It also means understanding and embracing these cutting edge tools that we now have for better managing complexity. Uh, you know, we can make a lot of progress by adopting 21st century best practices. You know, we first have to start by clarifying our goals, but then we have to focus on whether those goals are being met. We have to focus on outcomes, not compliance with rules. Policy shouldn't consist of untested assumptions. It should be what uh, in tech we call a build, measure, learn cycle. 
That is, we try something. If it works, we do more of it. If it stops working, if it doesn't work, we do less of it. You know, this, uh, central banks are probably the closest uh, we come to this in the area of public policy. Uh, you know, they say we're going to raise interest rates till inflation abates. And when inflation abates, they bring them back down. They don't just set some set of rules in motion like we do with so many laws uh, that last for decades and are never tested. So we have to make government's algorithmic systems more dynamic. We have to eliminate failed rules. We can't just build on top of them. And we have to fix the overall system, not individual problems. So in short, when we talk about digital transformation, we can't just talk about building commercial grade websites or apps. We can't talk about the metaverse. We can't even settle for building more dynamic, reflexive, real-time data systems. We have to engage with the possibilities of AI and machine learning. This is a coming wave that is as big or bigger than the original internet. It will completely change the nature of computer programming. That is how we talk to our machines, how we tell them what to do. And we're increasingly going to be training our machine helpers rather than giving them precise instructions. So we need to bring the scale and algorithmic reflexivity of tech to government, but we also have to bring public values to tech. Most importantly, if we want a better future, we have to do more than teach our machines to re recognize patterns or just to reach our business goals. We have to teach them what good looks like. They won't discover it on their own. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, one of the visionaries of digital transformation. Unfortunately, Tim could not be here today, but luckily we do have three other visionaries here with us today. So I would like to ask our esteemed panelists to join me on the stage. So we will start with the big picture view of the benefits and risks for society uh, related to digital transformation. Um, data economy constitutes one of the biggest technological and economic transformations in the past 100 years. Some have compared its impact to electricity or steam engine. Data is the most important raw material of our times. At the same time, there are concerns such as polarization of public discourse, ethical use of artificial intelligence that was also touched upon by the speakers, or the ever-increasing energy use of information and communication devices and networks. Nishant, what are the biggest benefits and risks for society from digitalization and data economy as we move towards 2030, in your opinion? I think let me start by talking about the opportunities because I think they somewhat outweigh the risks in that sense. If we look at, let's look at the concept of digitalization. What is digitalization? Is using data for the purpose of possibly finding productivity, efficiency, or security. At Bell Labs, actually, we did a study. It's a little bit dated, but the stats are still quite relevant that if you look at the world GDP, and then you say 30% of the industries have been quite well digitalized. That's where they spend, these 30% of the companies or industries spend 70% of the digitalization investment. The 70% of the GDP, these industries are not well digitalized. And they spend a little, far too little. And our belief is that based on the data economy that you just talked about, over the rest of this decade, the law of inversion will prove out. That means the 70% that are not digitalized or not sophisticated in their digitalization will invest now. And these industries are transport, manufacturing, mining, et cetera. These are physical industries. They will spend and invest on digitalization in the subsequent years of this decade. And that's where the law of inversion will prove out, that 70% more investment. Our belief is that this will create 
north of 8 trillion of global economic value. So that's the benefit. Productivity, efficiency, and security in this industry. Uh, we've talked a little bit today already around sustainability. Our other firm belief is that there is no green without digital. You need to find opportunities of how to use this process of digitalization to create more ecological benefits. In fact, there was a study by Accenture that said in the US, over the rest of this uh, three years until 25, 20% of environmental benefits will come on the back of digitalization and 5G. So digitalization productivity, for productivity, efficiency, and safety combined with green is what the opportunity is. This is where I actually see the opportunity, both from economic growth perspective and for the right thing for our planet. The risks, two risks that come to mind here, Crystal. One, I talked about this a little bit, you were mentioning in your speech, this opportunity of digitalization cannot be for a few privileged. It can be, I mean, if you look at the big platforms today, how do platforms exist and what makes them big is the access to data and their capability to train that data, refresh that data and use that data. It's a continuous process. Every big platform is very successful at doing that. But that cannot be an opportunity for just a few. When we digitalize now manufacturing, it can't be that manufacturing in Africa is not considered to be part of a digital journey. So inclusive growth based on digitalization is an important criteria to be kept in mind. The other one that you probably mentioned to about a little bit, the threat surface and the threat vectors grow. When we digitalize, everything starts to get connected. If you have sensors in a factory, suddenly a physical location became a digital location. The threat surface grew and that becomes a second risk that we need to cater for. Thank you, Nishan. Marissa, you have personally witnessed in global key roles the emergence of digital platforms that you also talked about as shapers of society. Some people call this phase Web 2.0. Looking back, what are the biggest lessons learned for societies in your experience from the role of platforms as drivers of digitalization? Uh, I think there's a lot of lessons, but I think the one that I would really call out is just how quickly uh, things can grow and things can change. Um, you know, when I think back on my childhood, I remember watching, uh, I don't know if it was popular here in Finland, but the cartoon The Jetsons, which was portrayed a science fiction future where everyone flew around. And I remember thinking when I was about five years old, like, wow, when the future's here, it'll be amazing because there'll be flying cars. <laughs> Right? And if you actually look at that, not much happened. Um, we don't have flying cars today. There are people who still experiment with it. But what did happen instead was the internet, um, the connectivity, the digitalization that's happened. And so you know, I think the lessons I've seen are it's, it's easy to uh, overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. Uh, how quickly things can can happen and change. I first came to Finland in 1999, right after I had started at Google, and I remember walking into an internet cafe. Do people remember those? They don't exist anymore, yeah. uh, thanks to, to so many wonderful networks. But and seeing this little website I was working on with a few dozen of my friends here in Finland, and I was like, how did it get here so quickly? Um, yesterday, I have some Finnish relatives who were kind enough to organize a tour of a school. And I remember kind of being blown away. I, you know, the pandemic made it very popular, but seeing Google Classroom used here to think, see how these platforms have moved and changed, moved into new industries, and you know, in just a few short decades have really become a, a, a standard tool in you know, classrooms all around the world. And so when you think about what can happen in terms of the connectedness we all feel today, the platforms, the compute power that we have, uh, how quickly things can, can change. And that has both opportunities, because it means that things can become very popular, very powerful, very quickly. Uh, and it also means that we need to be prepared to react really, really quickly. Um, when we think about 
uh, you know, some of the laws, for example, in the United States are just not suitable for today's technology. There's a big question around who's responsible for the content. Uh, and it turns out the laws that govern, that govern carriers and content um, are, you know, probably a, more, almost 100 years old. Whether or not when you send a letter in a sealed envelope, are you responsible, if you're the carrier that delivers that letter, are you responsible for what the person wrote inside of it? Of course not. But that is a very different question than the platforms we see today, like YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Um, you know, whether or not that same law and that same ideology applies, whether or not the person who's providing that service is responsible, it's a big question. And when you're sitting there looking at a space that can move so quickly in just a few years or decades, on using 100-year-old laws as a problem. So lots of opportunities based on, on the speed in which things can move and change, but also challenges that need to be responded to. Thank you very much. You mentioned your Finnish relatives, so indeed you, you are partially Finnish, are you not? Half, yes. <laughs> well, fantastic. We are happy you are here again in Finland. Christo, um, you have a lot of experience about weaponization of information and different security threats. How can we increase trust in data economy and digitalization of society? First of all, I want to correct you. I don't have experience in weaponizing information, but researching it. Researching, <laughs> that's true. Um, I wish you I had. Them this thing. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, well, first, I, I think it's important to be aware of the threats um, and to train that part of the population that chooses passively or actively to not be aware of the threats. I think this is the key. Uh, the key hurdle before we can regain trust in digital uh, in digital society. The, um, the problem is that many of the, especially younger people, um, are doing the same trade-off, accept the same trade-off that I described with the Russian society vis-a-vis -vis their privacy, uh, as long as they get the, the fast, Im immediate, imminent convenience of being able to access the digital world. Um, I was lecturing a couple of years ago, young people in uh, Vienna Economic University, and I, I did a survey at the end of the, the lecture and asked them how concerned they were about oversharing private data in the context of receiving services. And predominantly, the answer was that they were not concerned, that they didn't care what Google does with their private data, what Facebook does with their private data. And uh, yes, you might believe them and give them benefit of doubt they don't care now, but they will most likely care in 20 years. So it's somebody else's obligation to kind of uh, bring the risk of the future abuse of that data to, to their current self. So I think there's more that needs to be done there. But this goes hand in hand with the rather formal approach we've taken as a society and as a European Union and, and uh, everybody in terms of uh, protecting people from the unexpected danger of oversharing. So the cook is a disclaimer that we all get, that we all have to accept. That has become almost a, uh, a nuisance, an annoying factor for the user, even though this is done to defend the user's interest, but they see it as something that they have to just click away in order to get to the content that they so desire at this very moment. Uh, so it's actually counterintuitively what what society has tried to do to help people is backfiring because people are, are seeing the cookie disclaimers now as noise, as something that has to be gotten away of as soon as possible. So, uh, but if these people were given not the opportunity because the opportunity legally exists now, but were uh, almost confronted with what happens with these cookies, with the information that is being gathered for them. So imagine that uh, you consent to cookies and then by law, or by best practices, in a month, the same website that you consented to give uh, you to give cookies to, was obligated to do another pop-up and say, "Click here to find out what what we know about you now." I think if you proactively do that, a lot of people will realize for the first time what they're sharing. Now you have the opportunity to go and find the hidden place where Facebook will tell you what they know about you, and it's scary. But who does that? Nobody. But if we make it so that people are proactively told, check this out, then I think this changes the whole, uh, the whole attitude. And last, um, I would like to talk also about the loss of trust in uh, visual information because of deep fakes and generally of the ability to 
create um, any kind of information. I was um, having an argument with my editors a couple of months ago when we were doing an ident identification of a war crime and a war criminal, and we had a very thorough uh, group of evidence, piece of evidence that pointed to this person being the, war cr the criminal in that particular incident. But we didn't have a clear face of this person because he was looking away. Uh, so we couldn't compare him to the known face of uh, the person, that, uh, the identity that we knew. And the editors said, well, we can't call the name the name because we don't have a visual. But we had 150 other data points that proved to that. So we know the instincts that people have are old fashioned. They, they think that a face cannot be forged, but the face is the easiest one to fake. So I think one thing we need to change is for a more holistic view to information as opposed to instinctive use of information and believing something that, uh, so seeing something and believing it is the old fashioned way. We have to look at information holistically, which means uh, retraining or training people for critical thinking so that they just don't accept something that looks the right way. So I think, um, I think the generation that um, has grown up with the internet and with, uh, with data as uh, something available at their fingertips, we need for them to go through a full life cycle before we realize all of the dangers that they're exposed to. So we, some things we can predict now and start addressing them, like the ones I, did, I mentioned, but others we still have to wait another 10 years. Thank you very much. This next question, anybody can answer it. Um, I'd like to talk about digital sovereignty, which is a topic that is much talked about in the EU as of late. Digital sovereignty has been defined as means of promoting strategic autonomy and the ability to act independently in the digital field. It can be seen as a protective mechanism as well as means to foster digital uh, homegrown innovation. Can EU or any economic area achieve digital sovereignty, or are we simply too interdependent? In other words, is digital sovereignty a worthwhile political goal, in your opinion? I'll start very quickly by yeah. saying I'm allergic to the concept of digital sovereignty, because mm -hmm. it is the easiest way for autocratic governments to abuse it and say we want to essentially fireball protect our population from freedom of, uh, of information and freedom of information flow. And because digital sovereignty is not something that happens naturally uh, within the commercial world, uh, nobody's going to self-impose digital sovereignty um, unless they are a government. I'm afraid that it becomes too much power given to government. So that's my instinctive reaction here. Interesting. Anybody else want to have a shot at this? I think it's topical today. Digital sovereignty is not just a term that's used for in European context, it's used in now quite global context now. It's topical because of the geopolitical nature and the forces around it. It has to be, I, mean, to, I don't know if this is what you were referring to, Christopher, but it can be synonymous to protectionism. That's uh, anti in terms of any principle that at least I stand for. It has to be, now, there is an aspect of digi uh, digital sovereignty which has to be considered, which is that in certain segments or sectors, there is over-reliance of, for example, EU, and that becomes a risk in the long term. So if digital sovereignty were to mean that EU were to invest, for example, in semiconductor pr you know, production, to create some less form of you know, dependence. dependence. That, I think, is a, yeah. I would subscribe to that. But it can be, OK, then each of the 27 member states now start to put fabrication plants in every country. So I think the right way to look at digital sovereignty would be a joint digital sovereignty in trusted bubbles. And then looking at creating resilience in certain segments. That, I think, is a very positive thing. Very interesting. I think on these types of movements, you have to be careful, though, as you operationalize and for unintended consequences. You know, um, now it's, I guess, getting five to be five to ten years old, but the right to be forgotten was something that was extremely popular, very intoxicating, that notion of saying, wait, I want to be able to tell this service, forget everything you know about me. 
Um, but I will say, having been inside of companies, trying to implement that and even interpret what does that mean, right? Because there's the very literal data that you gave the company, your email address, you know, your, your clicks, your searches, right? But then there's all kinds of, in the face of AI, abstractions of that data, things that have been learned on top of that data, transformations of that data. Does that need to be forgotten? How exactly does it work? And so I think that, you know, um, I think that a lot of companies came up with good ways to achieve the right to be forgotten. Um, but I think in many cases it wasn't necessarily what was intended by the original discussions. Uh, and um, I think it's important when you look at those types of things, where because the interconnectedness matters so much, where that data goes, how it travels, how it moves, whether it's across borders in the case of sovereignty or for individuals, it can be tricky and complicated to get it right. And I think sometimes the worst outcome can be people feeling that they have that sovereignty when they really don't or when it's being abused behind the scenes. I'd like to take us from this team to, to the next kind of topic, which is the liberal and, and democratic model versus autocratic model in, in governing data economy. And Krista, you a little bit alluded to this in your remarks, because we can clearly witness two different types of approaches of governing digitalization, data economy, and the internet emerging. On one hand, we have the democratic liberal societies. On the other hand, we have the autocratic um, societies and, and a more centralized model. And as a concrete example, um, the huge volume of data collected of us um, by digital platforms can make us susceptible to information operations, as we saw in the case of Cambridge Analytica. The European Union is trying to solve this through regulation that increases transparency of individuals, to allow individuals to make more informed choices, while autocratic countries outright ban negative messaging on sensitive topics, for example. This is just one example of the differences between democratic and autocratic models. Which approach will be more effective in governing data economy and why? Krista, you want to start because you, you brought it up in your opening. I, I did. Um, I'll just expand on what I believe, um, which is um, you, you, you gave two extreme examples. Um, one is the, let's say, the European one, and the other one is the Chinese one, the prohibition of negative messaging. But I don't think these are the realistic threats to our part of the world or to the liberal democracy part of the world. The realistic threat comes from the Russian model, which the previous Russian model, which was allowing negative messaging, but knowing, being aware that the way the internet works, it will remain enclosed in a bubble and it will not cause the rest of the people, the majority of the people, to find out the truth uh, or to experience the uh, sort of negative messaging. And I think this is what Cambridge Analytica actually helped bad actors in the real liberal democracies to perfect and to borrow from these, from these uh, um, modern or advanced autocrats. And I, I really think that's where the risk is because countries in Central Eastern Europe, some of them, like two or three countries, are still using that same approach that, um, that uh, let's say, uh, certain people in, in the US try to abuse. Um, and this is, this is a risk that, that continues because invisibly this can, this can create divisions in society, this can create society that requires an arbiter to be there to help them uh, solve these divisions, and this is a recipe for um, soft dictatorship, and that's, that's where the risk is from my perspective. Let me a little bit move this discussion onwards because um, as a result of this competition between these two models, we've witnessed today a real threat of fragmentation of internet as well. What should be done to avoid this? I can comment on that one. Uh, I'm very glad you took the first question. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm so far away from political science, but I think the internet if you look at it, it's one of the most, uh, I mean, it's, it's the fact that internet, the way it exists across the world in a, in a harmonious way, is, 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 it needs to continue. Now, if you look at the way we access internet, all of us, we either access internet today using our mobile devices, 
over wireless infrastructure, or we access internets at home office, and that's based on fixed infrastructure. The problem of this fragmentation, it starts to manifest itself into when the wireless industry starts to fragment. Let's take a, you know, a short trip down. Uh, we're now, like I said in my speech, we're in the world of 5G. If you go back 15 years, there was a technology called 3G. I think most of the people, most people in the room would remember. 3G was different the way it was implemented in Europe. It was different in the way it was implemented in US and a complete island in China. What that does is, is the cost per unit of connectivity goes up tremendously. And everyone loses. Then came 4G, LTE. Every country came together and said, we need to build one standard for wireless infrastructure. Otherwise, the cost is not getting the right inclusion. And when LTE came along, whether it was Japan, whether it was Korea, US, Europe, Russia, China, everyone agreed on one common standard for the world. And that was when we saw a true impetus to what we now call as mobile broadband. One of the most successful turns in the wireless industry came with one standard in 4G. We've continued that with 5G, and our intent and our focus should be that in 6G, the world should be on one harmonious standard. And it's the same for fixed infrastructure. Fixed infrastructure is not standardized. Fixed infrastructure is built on principles that come out of the ITU. And we can't let some of this political fractionism impact. I'll, I'll give you a very, you know how many uh, people in this world are not connected even today? Almost three billion people on this earth don't have sufficient mobile broadband. And if you fragment these standards and political fractionism come in, this will get worse and we cannot allow that to happen. The World Economic Forum, it did a study that uh, in uh, lower income countries, when connectivity for mobile broadband or bro any form of broadband goes up 10%, the GDP gets a 2% uplift. So we need to make sure that the political fractionism doesn't enter, you know, enter the technology and telecommunication domains. That's my firm view. Thank you very I, much. I may take this in a little bit of a controversial place, way, yep. but and trying to tie the last two questions together, I would make the statement that I think if you move from data to technologies and the way technologies are governed and guided, the internet is already fragmented, at least in terms of its applications. You know, in the West, we have Google and Amazon and Facebook. In China, they have Baidu, which is every bit as good as Google. They have Alibaba, which is as amazing as Amazon. They have WeChat, which is, you know, a technology that kind of combines all the different shopping and social network technologies together in a way that hasn't really been able to re be replicated in the West. And so I think in many ways, there already are, are, are sort of two different forms of the internet. And we're starting to see what happens in, in when you govern them these got technologies differently. And I think the, the real question in my mind is what happens with artificial intelligence. Because I think it's very clear that the real race and, and, and way that the governance of these technologies will ultimately be measured is between the West and China. Uh, and they take the two very different approaches to AI. China has essentially fed all of the faces of their citizens into facial recognition, and they use it for, on everything from parking to speeding tickets, uh, and they can use it as pervasively as they want. Um, in the West, Google Maps, we can still debate whether or not faces need to be scrubbed off of images or, or street numbers need to be scrubbed off of buildings. Um, uh, and it's not clear which approach is going to, to work out better. I certainly know which one I'm rooting for, um, but I think that that's really going to be one of the key questions for the next decade is which of these models of technology governance as opposed to data governance really yield the best outcome because it's clear that artificial intelligence is going to be uh, an incredible tool and whoever builds the best tool is going to be really best positioned um, to make their decisions and, and, and make the motions that they want to make. Thank you very much. And let that's, that's actually a fantastic bridge because I'd like to ask to now a little bit look towards the future. 
um, AI and, and Web 3.0. Um, and you've now mentioned, Marisa, also, and, and several of you also in your, in your remarks, artificial intelligence, AI, as a disruptive technology. And the big question is its ethical use, as we've already touched upon. And anybody can take this. Uh, what, in your view, are the biggest risks related to ethical use of AI, and what should we do about it? I, I think um, there are several examples that one can cite. I mean, unintended at times, but AI has come out with different outcomes, and at times less than optimal outcomes, right? Uh, and I, I would go to the point of saying, so let's look at ourselves at Nokia, right? We have AI in every part of the company now. It's used to build systems, it's used to build customer interaction, it's everywhere. We set out ourselves six principles that we abide by. Fairness, transparency, security, sustainability, accountability. These principles are critical for anyone in the company implementing AI. It also helps in implementing faster because the principles are set. Without these principles, there is a big underlying risk that unintentionally somebody would produce a training model which creates uh, you know, some kind of um, division. It could create some kind of uh, selectionism, elitism, and we want to avoid that absolutely. And it's a topic that I think all of us need to talk more about. We are the most intelligent species, and we are now able to replicate intelligence artificially. It has to be done ethically as well. Look, I come from the world of Gandhi. 70 years ago, Gandhi named the seven sins, you know, wealth without work, knowledge without character, science without humanity. I think in 2020s, with no lack of respect to those seven, we need to add an eighth one. There should not be no AI without ethics in this world. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a great perspective. Anybody else want to? Absolutely. Um, well, I think that when you think about AI, we have to think about what the consequences are. And I agree with Tim O'Reilly that in many cases, AI is really a mirror when we see it being biased, when we see it doing unfair and unjust things, it's basically because the training data it was given, the examples it was given, had a, had a bias in them, whether they were known and recognized or not. So to me, I think a big piece of getting AI right and, and deploying it ethically is having a, an eye towards uh, free speech and diversity of thought, so you don't end up in that type of bubble where you don't understand what you don't understand or don't see. Um, and the ability to think critically about the systems. There definitely is always the, the type of technology worship of, well, this amazing piece of technology created this. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it ethical? Is it not? And I think we need to ma maintain our ability to think critically about what's been created and, and uh, the values that it portrays. Christo, are you worried about ethics of AI? Oh. Absolutely, but not only about AI, also about other aspects of the digital future. But on AI, I couldn't com agree more. I think the risk is that AI left unguided to learn from, from human behavior uh, will pick up on, on outliers as the most salient uh, uh, examples of a certain vector of, uh, of thought. And those outliers are likely to result in really bad AI uh, virtual people, uh, racist, and, and so on and so forth. So I think inadvertent AI is probably as big of a risk as, as bad AI. Uh, but uh, just one other thing I want to um, caution, because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, is the uh, false assumption that moving t into the digital world will, um, and in particular, if, let's take the metaverse as one example of moving from uh, the offline world to the online world, will reduce inequality. And um, I think that's a false assumption because if we just let the world move to, let's say, conducting business in a metaverse world, the offline world, the offline business, day-to-day -day business is potentially going to happen largely 
in a metaverse kind of environment. This is likely to only increase inequality because the people who get into that capability now are the people that have the free time, that have the capacity, the money to actually be there. So they'll have the first uh, mover advantage over anybody else who's poorer or less uh, poorer with time or with money. And even having a different set of devices, lower quality will disadvantage you to the ones who have a better quality. So we have to be aware that no, it's not going to happen naturally, that equality will improve in the digital world. I, I have some, I think it's a great point, and it was sort of my conclusion, that metaverse can be for one and only by one. Yeah. I think the award that was given this year at the Millennium Forum here was on solar panels, right? On the PERC technology. And that helped democratize that technology. The same has to happen with the metaverse not just for energy consumption, energy sustainability, but metaverse, which is gonna be such a fundamental change, a revolution in terms of digitalization. There needs to be enough research and tooling and process and platform that helps democratize it. Otherwise, it will not meet its potential. I'd like to briefly, if, if we could, uh, touch upon Web 3.0, and there's a little bit conceptual um, what one could say, competition. Some people categorize metaverse under Web 3.0, some treat them separate. But um, let me define it like this, that the world is entering the age of decentralized web or Web 3.0. And Web 3.0 has emerged in part as a reaction against the problems of Web 2.0 and the market power of centralized actors, such as digital platforms. But I'd like to kind of end on a more positive note than if, if we have time to squeeze in a question from the audience as well. So as we look into the future of Web 3.0, decentralized web or metaverse, um, and in general digital transformation, what is the one thing that you are most excited about? Maris. Uh, I'm, I'm excited overall about what blockchain can do. Uh, I'm excited to understand um, what it can do just to overall drive better accountability. I think that that was probably one of the key shortfalls of Web 2.0. And so if through better understanding of where information came from, how digital goods and, and um, monies are moving, uh, I think that that could drive a lot more accountability. And so I, I'm excited about, uh, about that. Thank you. Nishan. I think uh, the fact that Web 3.0, the concept of tokenization, and to your point, Marisa, it's an open ledger. Mm -hmm. It creates a level of transparency that was missing in Web 2.0. I know you wanted to end on a positive note, but I am, let's say, I'm also very cautious in my optimism here. Because the early trends that I see with Web 3.0 is that the translation engines from Web 2 to Web 3.0 are sort of becoming pseudo platforms in themselves. We can't allow that to happen. The concept of blockchain and tokenization and decentralization needs to be authentic. Otherwise, some of the pipes between two and three will create newer platforms, which is what the intent is to avoid from the beginning. So transparency I'm excited about, but I'm worried about the fact that it may not happen to the extent that we're expecting. Thank you. Krista. Considering that my main topic of research has been uh, weaponization of uh, disinformation, I still think that the best thing we can hope for uh, Web3 is exactly the uh, uh, tools to validate the provenance of information, uh, to make sure that something is not deep fake. And pairing any piece of information with some easy to use provenance tracking, blockchain or otherwise tokenization is going to be one way to make sure that uh, we're not going to be taken advantage by just loads of credible information that is really fake. Thank you. Well, we do have time for at least one question from the audience. So I think we have a microphone over there and over there. Just raise your hand if you have a question to our panelists. There in the middle, gentlemen over there. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the very interesting panel session. Uh, I was wondering, this is related to the problems with AI, uh, what about expendable AI? It's a huge field, emerging field, a lot of research, and seems to offer some solutions to many of the uh, 
uh, issues you raised. So what's your take on explainable AI and its application in the future? Who would like to take this? Definitely not me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think uh, I, I said you're talking about expendable AI, yes? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that it does address some elements of it, that notion that you can build a technology and ultimately move away from it very quickly. Uh, I think overall it does address some things. I think it's an emerging field, and so it, it, um, it has some promise. I think it's, it's set to be seen, does it solve uh, all of the issues that we've covered? I, I would agree. I think. Uh... The one concept that expandable AI brings is the refreshment of data. And that creates some level of democratization already. So it's said that, again, cautiously optimistic, because it hasn't proven out yet. In some of the biggest, bigger platforms, they still need very conventional CNN modes that need huge investments for training models. So we'll see if it can actually scale yet to be proven. But it's a good step forward. I think we have time for one more question. So please raise your hand if you have a question uh, to the panelists uh, there at the back, at the very back. Yes, so as Nishant mentioned, uh, um, currently only 10% of the Earth's surface has internet connections, and similarly, 3 billion people do not have coverage. What do you see the role of satellites? Like, I am familiar with uh, some of the projects from Nokia. They are working on non terrestrial networks. So do you think, like, satellites can also play a role in metaverse? Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, if you just go back, I mean, it's very topical again, right? Apple announces with Global Star, Android announces. Then we have, I mean, we announced with AST, which is funded by Vodafone and AT&T. There is um, Starlink that announced with T-Mobile in the US, Reliance Geo, in, and then, I mean, this is, it's happening now. I am, let's say, when I am talking about the 2.9 billion who don't have substantial, or let's say reasonably substantial mobile broadband, I do not believe that non-terrestrial is the way to get there, and I'll tell you why. If you are, let's say, in this room, does non-terrestrial work? No. 70% of broadband initiations happen indoor. Non-terrestrial does not work there. Non-terrestrial has a place, which is when you're out in the boonies and you need connectivity, and it's still very lean connectivity. You can send a message, you can probably make a call if you're lucky. So it's a complement to terrestrial network, but it will not be the backbone for inclusion. I don't see it happen this decade. We need to research more the satellite costs, both to launch and to operate, have to go down more. The sizes have to shrink tremendously. Even then, we will not be able to solve the indoor problem. It just doesn't work. So it's a good tool in the toolkit, but we need to think broader. Thank you very much. I want to thank the panelists for an excellent discussion. Thank the audience for great questions and uh, and then for this uh, wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed to all the panelists and um, to Christoph for making a valiant attempt to have a sort of happy ending to the story. I, I must say <laughs> this, this session has felt uh, less like opportunities to be seized and more like dangers to be avoided. But um, and, and not to be too flippant about some of the things we were talking about here, but for me, that session was something of an emotional roller coaster and very informative. First of all, Marissa reminded me that my employer, The Economist, has been checking out these large language models and sounds like you were convinced by what came out, so my job's in danger. But then almost in the next breath, she said she's hiring. So. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I learned from uh, Tim O'Reilly's speech, I, I, uh, a phrase I've heard a million times, I've, I guess I've had it wrong all these years, it's WTF is what's the future? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> right, who's ready for a coffee? A bunch of people are ready for a coffee, very good. Uh, we have almost exactly half an hour for it, we will see you back here at 3.30. Thanks very much. Thank you.